Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, December 11th, and welcome officially to week 18 of the Diane Jenkins murder mystery. 18 weeks we have been without any sort of well, solution, resolution, much less any real evidence. It's been tons of little tiny bits and pieces of information, but really no substantial evidence as to who killed her. Yet so much time has been spent trying to figure it out. And I am near my breaking point. To be completely honest with you, when I watch the show lately, I just am feeling frustrated because I am ready to put this whole thing to bed. I'm ready to get the answer. I just, I, I don't even care about the journey anymore. I hate to say that. All I want to know is who did it and how they did it and I want to get it over with and move on to something else. I just feel that way, yet all we keep doing is plummeting further and further down the rabbit hole and the, the, it's just getting deeper and more messy and almost it feels like the mess that has been created in the wake of Diane's death is worse than her death. It's just become so complicated and I just, uh, there's no end in sight. I can't see any end in sight and it really truly is it's bothering me. It's weighing on me. It's getting on my nerves. I just feel like Ugh. <laughs> That's how I feel lately when I'm watching the show. And on, on Friday, Lionard did this very interesting <sighs> format for the show wherein they showed us kind of the end of like basically what would have been the end of Friday's show and then they jumped around in time showing us 10 minutes prior, 20 minutes prior, you know kind of like a memento sort of piecing together of the puzzle of that day's show and when I started watching on Friday I <laughs> had so much hope when I saw that they were doing this unique thing, that, that the story was unraveling in a unique way, something that they haven't done before. I had high hopes that by the end, something significant would have happened, yet... <sighs> Basically, just uh, A, annoying things happened, and B, more so-called evidence about what happened the night of Diane's murder. I just, in and the, and the end of it, I'm like, really? That, I mean, you just, they did this funky format for that amount of information. That could have been accomplished with just a regular show. When are we going to get somewhere? That's my question. That's the main thing that's weighing on my mind with this whole thing is, when are we going to get somewhere? Because so far, all we have right now is Victor sitting in jail and everybody else running around like chickens with their heads cut off. He's insisting that he's the one that killed Diane when pretty much at this point the only thing we know for sure is that he isn't the one who killed Diane. He was there, obviously he was there, but uh, it, by virtue of the fact that he's the one sitting in jail we know that he's the, not the one that did it. And nobody believes him. Nobody believes him. He's just telling this story about how he did it. And Victoria doesn't believe him. Nicholas doesn't believe him. Nikki doesn't believe him. Michael doesn't believe him. Sharon doesn't believe him. I don't believe him. Do you believe him? Nobody believes him. Yet, he keeps trying. And the fact that he keeps trying almost makes it more obvious that it's not true. He goes to a hearing this week, pleads guilty to murder. And the judge doesn't believe him either. Well, Ronan had a little bit of something to do with that. I mean, Ronan's starting to put together the pieces, too. He's realizing that, wait a minute, this is just way too convenient. So he stands up, tells the judge, 
hang on a second, we have other evidence, we have reason to believe that there may be other suspects, so don't accept this man's guilty plea. We think that it's, you know, part of a scam, which it is, and the judge decides to not accept Victor's plea. So there goes his grand plan. And uh, the thing, I think, you'll have to forgive me, I'm working through this. Uh, as I'm talking, I'm working through my feelings on this, because I feel deeply about it. The thing that bothers me is that Victor is trying so hard to make it look like he's guilty to save Nikki who he thinks was the one that committed the crime or to stop her from admitting anything that she might have done that night or whatever, but he's trying to do it as a as a selfless thing. And in the back of my mind, too, I'm thinking, why now, Victor? He's resolving himself to a lifetime in prison. Why now? Why choose now to finally do something for somebody else. It's like anything Victor ever always does is about him, ultimately. He's never <laughs> thrown himself in front of a bus for Nikki or anyone else before. And I just, I feel like this is a problem with the writing because if we would have seen some kind of uh, aside with Victor, maybe in his cell or something, where he starts talking about how he doesn't feel like he can do anything for his family anymore, you know, that his kids don't love him and, and Nikki's better off without him. You know, if it was that kind of, like, uh, what do you call it, like a suicide mission or something, or, or like a kamikaze mission, you know, and we had a sense of that, then I think it would be a different story. But for the most part, I, I'm left questioning Victor's motives. Why not decide to throw yourself in front of a bus uh, or why not choose to do the right thing when uh, you were holding Billy hostage? Why not choose to do the right thing when you were withholding evidence in Sharon's trial? Why not choose to do the right thing when you brought Patty into town, which result ended up resulting in Colleen's death? Why now? It's just not fitting together for me. And he's not giving up. Now, all of a sudden, he's working with this investigator on the case uh, to try to plant evidence like that. Okay, you know that curly-haired investigator chick? She shows up on the scene at the very end of Friday's show with the little vial and the little needle and she hands it to Victor who decides to put his fingerprints all over it. So he's bribed this investigator who we've seen before, who for all, uh, you know, everything we know about her, she seemed to be legitimate. Now all of a sudden he's able to bribe her from the inside to put his fingerprints on this evidence to further solidify what he wants to be done. And I just, I, we have no reason to think that she is a bad cop. Why now? Again, why now? And furthermore, instead of spending all of your energy trying to make yourself look guilty, why not try to find a way out of it for both you and Nikki? Why not start brainstorming some other solutions rather than you just deciding to take the fall for everybody? I just, I don't get it, Victor. I don't buy it, Victor. And I think the only hope that we have still left in this situation is Ronan, who, as a result of standing in the way of Victor giving his guilty confession, giving the DA's office the conviction that they want so badly, Ronan got thrown off the case. Now, I don't know if he is just thrown off of that case or if he got completely fired. But either way, he may have lost his job for that decision. And we kind of saw a preview from next week's show that it looks like he's not going to give up. He's going to continue on the investigation. Good God! Please! Please! Please. Let him find out what happened and please let it happen soon. Deacon showed back up this week front and center and first of all I do have to give it up to the actor because he plays smarmy so well. 
I am buying it. I mean, now knowing that Sean Kanan is Mr. Gentleman, just watching how sleazy he is <laughs> in the character of Deacon just makes me appreciate him so much more because he is truly sleazy. It makes me sick. Even just seeing him on screen, just the way he paws at Nikki and looks at her and, you know, he is doing this whole, I know what you did thing, sort of, it's, it's he's been doing this since the very beginning, not really revealing what he knows, just kind of like, like a cat playing with a yarn ball, just batting at it a little bit. And, you know, I mean, the whole week I'm thinking, I wish he would just spit it out, whatever it is. Just tell us what you know, Deacon. And finally, we did um, get some information from him, which again, I don't even, I don't even believe. Basically, Deacon said that he was there the night that Diane was murdered. He saw the whole thing. And essentially, Victor was yelling at Diane, laying into her, and Diane was yelling back, saying mean things about Nikki. So Victoria runs in and bashes Diane over the head with the rock. Nikki runs up, tries to save Diane or stop the situation or whatever, and that's how she got all bloody and rocked. And 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 he's basically trying to make it look like it was Victoria that did it. So last week we're coming away with the impression that Nikki did it. This week we're coming away with the impression that Victoria did it. What the heck? I just I almost like it almost pains me to talk about this. It's just it's that confusing and that ridiculous and that absurd and I frankly don't really believe anything that comes out of Deacon's mouth anyway. Uh, someone made, a couple people actually last week made the point that, uh, probably Deacon was the one that killed her. Yeah, he knows what happened at the scene because he was there. I mean, I think that's as good of an excuse as any. And he certainly has been using this whole blackmail thing to his advantage. He's been hanging around Nikki trying to make it seem like he cares about her. And, and, you know, I think that his behavior... It is really, you know, it kind of sets a precedent that he could have been the one that killed Diane because he has this sick, twisted way of trying to show Nikki that he cares about her. And I do think he would at this point do anything to try to get to her. I mean, he really has been obsessed with her for weeks and months. She comes back into town. She's drinking again. He's clearly stalking her, clearly hanging out where she is. And just doing this sick, disgusting game of like, okay, baby, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna make it better. She's like passed out on the couch and he's kissing her head, calling her baby. And I'm like, get your hands off of her. <laughs> How dare you touch her? And not only that, but he's hanging around at the ranch acting like he's the new man of the house. It's just making me sick. I feel like... <laughs> I think Deacon just desperately wants to be accepted, and I think he, in his own weird mind, thinks Nikki is his ticket to that. Nikki is probably one of the only people in this town that reached out to him and tried to see the good in him and tried to help him, and he turned around and, you know, knocked her off the wagon as a, you know, just, you know, thanks a whole lot for helping me, now he knocks her off the wagon. And I'm trying to understand his character. I think that that's why he's doing what he's doing is he ultimately just wants love and acceptance, but he's making me sick in the process. He has now revealed to Nikki that, that he, well, what he saw or what he says he saw, and he's now using it to blackmail her. <laughs> he drags her to Vegas and forces, oh God, he forces her to marry him. <sighs> downstairs to the gift shop and bought her a white dress and a veil with this feather thing shooting out of it. <laughs> like, Nikki looked great, but I'm just, it's hilarious to me that Deacon went out and picked her out an outfit to get married in. And he's just so pathetic. Just, 
you know, begging her to just be sweet to me the way you used to, and just eyeballing her and forcing her into this ceremony and forcing her to smile for pictures and and sending that picture to the you know his friend who's at a tabloid and acting like he's all happy and married and and hey it's Mr. and Mrs. Sharp and just pathetic. It's just absolutely pathetic. And I just can't help but think, God, I bet Nikki wish she just would have wishes she just would have stayed in rehab. Because no matter how bad that picture of Nikki and Victor in bed was getting out into the press and into the public, the picture of her and Deacon as a newlywed couple standing there smiling for the camera with glitter in their hair, that picture hitting the press is going to be so much worse. Hey, speaking of disgusting, Ricky literally makes me ill. He makes me want to throw up. Like, he gives me the Deacon vibe. I think Ricky and Deacon would be BFF. They should start hanging out, having beers together because they're two little disgusting peas in a pod. Ricky! Bleh! <laughs> Just bleh! He's, he's, he's physically unappealing to me. He, he's, he, his actions are unappealing to me. He is acting like he's a little junior kid reporter in Genoa City trying to get the hottest scoop. He goes to Restless Style, which Billy is running now, and he tries to get a job. He tries to convince Billy to hire him, and he thinks, <laughs> I don't know what freaking planet he's living on, but he thinks that he's going to curry favor with Billy by getting information out of the Genoa City Police Department, classified information that shows that Nikki is seriously a suspect, that they're seriously considering her um, as a prime suspect in Diane's murder. So he takes this to Billy as if publishing an article about his wife's mother <laughs> is going to ingratiate him or get him a job. Not to mention the fact that the kid has no experience and he's begging for to be the editor-in-chief of Restless Style. He's just, he's overshooting, he's overambitious, he clearly doesn't care uh, who he steps on along the way. It's really sort of unfortunate because I feel like I was just starting to feel good about the fact that Heather was off the scene, my least favorite character, Heather, and then we go and have to get her brother. <laughs> of course, of course, it would have to happen like that. And they're just, they both annoy me, but I don't know, like in some ways I think Ricky annoys me more. And when Billy turned him down flat with this you know, with his little job appeal, Ricky ends up running into Phyllis at the athletic club. And Phyllis convinces him to hack in to the Restless Style website and post this article about Nikki. And, like, again, I am not understanding. Maybe I'm off this week or something. That's entirely possible. <coughs> but I keep thinking, I could, uh, what does, why would Ricky even want to do that? I can kind of sort of understand Phyllis wanting to do it, wanting to get the information out there because it's the article that she was got, got fired over, basically. So I can see Phyllis's motivation there. But what exactly does Ricky have to gain by publishing this article. It, it, it makes no sense to me. Does it make sense to you? Leave me a comment. Let me know. Please help me clarify. Sharon knows that Victor is not guilty and she's not just going to let it go unnoticed. So she's determined to find out the truth. She hires Avery to do an independent investigation to try to get some answers and she actually does so with Michael's blessing so in a way because Michael knows that Victor isn't guilty he's kind of 
you know, stuck between a rock and a hard place. He has to defend his client as his client wants him to, but he also knows that Victor didn't do it. So he's helping Victor on the one hand, but he's kind of out of the side of his mouth telling Avery, yeah, go ahead, why don't you just try to keep finding the evidence, trying to get toward the truth. <laughs> in so many ways, I think, that everybody just thinks everybody else. Like, I think Victor thinks that Nikki and Victoria uh, maybe were in on what happened with Diane, and Victoria thinks Victor did it. And, like, but I just, I can't help feeling that they're, they all are wrong. I just, I can't help feeling that none of them did it. But... I, I, between Ronan's, Ronan's investigation and Sharon and Avery's investigation, I really want to get to what happened that night because Ronan, uh, has, you know, uncovered the fact that Adam was there. He was there that night. And clearly, even though, you know, Deacon on the one hand was there, Adam was kind of, was there too. And so I think while, uh, the Deacon thing happens simultaneously, hope, hopefully, um, uh, Sharon's going to get to, uh, get to Adam because the best way to find out what exactly Adam knows is to use Sharon as a pawn. And that's exactly what she and Avery are doing. Sharon's kind of trying to get close to Adam to get information out of him. She's carrying a recorder in her purse and she is hoping to get something on tape, hoping to use the fact that Sharon is his one and only weakness, I think, to try to help Victor. And I think out of all of this, the Adam and Sharon scenes <laughs> were the most pleasurable for me for the week. Sharon and Adam coming together, she's kind of trying to pretend that she's into him so that she can get information out of him. He's clearly still into her, and I think in some ways she's still very much into him, but fighting it. They had a kiss this week, which Sharon did not really, I mean, she was in for just a moment and quickly pulled herself out of, but I still think that Sharon is fighting feelings for Adam, and even though I know in my head that he has done a lot of wrong, wrong things to her, <laughs> throwing away the memory card, the whole wedding in jail, like all of those things are so terrible, but I just feel like Adam and Sharon have this chemistry that is putting a smile on my face when everything else on the show is kind of pissing me off right now. <laughs> so just let me have this one. Let me have this week of Sharon and Adam <sighs> just coming together for a few moments, remembering New Orleans, remembering their chemistry. <sighs> it was kind of good. But it's not going to last very long because Nick is there, like, dr you know, tossing water onto their fire, just trying to douse it. Um, he's <sighs> hovering over Sharon the way <sighs> he always does. You know, he's telling her that if she wants to have any kind of contact with her daughter, then she has to go through Nick, she, and she has to stay away from Adam. You know, she's not allowed to see him. She's not allowed to have contact with him. And it's 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 really tough because Sharon, on the one hand, she did promise Nick that she would stay away from Adam, yet she's trying desperately to save Victor. And, you know, a point that was made last week, and, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to overlook this by any means. It just seems like it's it's just been weeks and weeks and weeks but since this, but I, I, it is true that Victor was the one who got Sharon into the mess that she was in in the first place. So I can, I, I mean, I can understand that argument. Sharon wants to help Victor, but, you know, there should be a limit. You know, if, if it's putting your daughter's uh, you know, being able to see your daughter, if it's putting that in jeopardy, then maybe that's not such a good idea, because it's true, Victor was both the cause of and the solution to Sharon's legal troubles in the first place, so, I, I mean, as much as you want to help him, I, you know, I don't know if, you know, if, if putting your, your daughter, you know, your relationship with your daughter in jeopardy is the best thing to do, but 
I, you know, either way, I don't know. I'm still enjoying it. I just, I enjoy the pull between Sharon and Adam. It's just endlessly interesting to me. And Sharon just looked so amazing this week. She just looked beautiful. She was wearing this gorgeous, like, fuchsia outfit and these big, bling, diamondy earrings. And her hair just looked really good. And Sharon just looked good. It's It's been a while since she's really been moving around on the scene. You know, she's been in jail for so long. And, um, and now she's back. And I just thought she looked great. And I've just been enjoying uh, having her around. But Avery is starting to realize now that getting Sharon off the hook and back into Genoa City is probably interfering with her plans. I mean, Avery wants to be with Nick. She clearly has a thing for Nick, but she's learning firsthand as she's watching Nick, you know, make uh, threats to Sharon, I mean, she's realizing that Nick still plays a huge role in Sharon's life. I mean, I think Avery is finally getting a taste of what Phyllis has gone through for years. And she's just now discovering Nick's unwavering involvement in Sharon's life. And she's not liking what she's seeing, but in some ways it's kind of fitting. It's, you know, I mean, she moved in on Phyllis's territory and now she's going to have to deal with the, the problems, the inherent problems that come with seeing Nick. I mean, it's, it's just, welcome to the party. Nick has decided to go back to Newman Enterprises? Why? I was so, so disappointed to hear that. I really was. It, wh what happened to the whole new business thing that he was hoping to start up with Victoria? I really thought that that was going to be interesting, and now those hopes are just dashed. He, he's essentially just switching places with Victoria. He's, you know, he, he'll, he is where she was, like, six months ago after the lawsuit, and frankly, he's going to be in the same place as her, out of a job, fed up with Victor, done with Newman Enterprises in six months. I mean, after the whole Victor in jail thing gets over with, Victor will be back at Newman Enterprises and he'll be, I'm sure, calling the shots and not making either of his sons happy because the, I guess the good thing about it is it sets up a head-to-head -head between Nick and Adam, which I always enjoy. I, I like, I, I love Adam in this business situation. I love... Adam in Victor's office holding press conferences, trying to be the big man, you know, with his Harvard MBA, and just, uh, he's so wonderfully smug. He belongs in a corporate atmosphere. He just has the exact right personality, <clears throat> sociopathic, for it. So I, I like seeing him there, and uh, I just, um, I don't know, I think Adam likes being there. You know, he's, he's, he, he enjoys being in charge, and I think he's not above a little bit of blackmail to ensure that he is will stay in charge. He actually paid a visit to Nikki this week to try to convince her to keep Nick out of the picture at Newman. He basically told her, I mean, everybody's blackmailing Nikki every way around. He told Nikki that he saw what happened at the park, and if she wants him to keep quiet, then she's got to convince Nick to stay out of the way, out of his way at Newman Enterprises. I mean, that, that's, that's Adam's new thing. He's going to let the world burn around him. He doesn't really care, I don't think, what happens uh, with the Diane scenario. I think he just wants to be in charge at Newman. And I'm very surprised, though, that Victor is letting him be in charge. It's almost it's just kind of hard to believe that Victor is just letting the fox run the hen house? Uh, I, I mean, Adam went to pay a visit to Victor this week, and in exchange for Adam keeping with his story that Victor killed Diane, being the witness, Victor let him at, you know, get at his company, which is another thing that doesn't make sense to me. It's like, again, I'm not understanding Victor's motives for this, because why would Victor let... Adam, I mean, it's like Victor's just letting his whole life die. Not only is he accepting the fact that he's going to go to jail for a probably life, but then he's just going to let Adam ruin his legacy now? I, it just doesn't, I, I'm just, it doesn't make sense. Like, what would stop Adam from running Newman Enterprises right into the ground? I mean, except for maybe his reputation. I mean, Adam probably doesn't want to ruin his reputation, but I could totally see Adam getting in at Newman just to take it down. So it's very surprising to me that Victor would allow him to do that. I mean, I don't know. I, 
either way, I just like I said, I like seeing Adam at Newman Enterprises, just reading from, from his body language. I think that his involvement there is so much about control for him. You know, I think he is tired of being treated like a second-class citizen, and I think he thinks that having the appearance of Victor's approval, you know, like calling that press conference, I think he thinks that will give him both, you know, that'll give him, you know, credibility and keep him in charge, but, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's going to be very interesting. Maybe next week we can start <laughs> oh, we can start transitioning out of the the Zion murder storyline and start transitioning into a good maybe corporate compelling storyline. That's what I hope anyway. Oh, so what did you guys think about Daniel and Eden this week? They decided to have a little non-date um, at the movie theater. Daniel and Eden go to the movie theater to watch a French film. And what do they know? Lily and Kane are there too. It's kind of awkward because I can't, I really, honestly, I can't tell if Daniel is still hung up on Lily or if he just hates that she's still into Kane. I'm not sure which is which, but one thing I do know is that Eden is into Daniel, and Kevin is acting like an overprotective dad. You know, that he finds out that Daniel and Eden are going on a, going to a movie, and he immediately starts issuing a warning to Daniel, like, keep your hands off my sister, which I don't know. I just thought, wow, Kevin, geez. <laughs> What's happening there? But his warning went unheeded because... <laughs> After the movie, Eden and Daniel went back to Daniel's studio and they had painty sex. <laughs> it was just they started playing around with the paint just on a canvas and before you knew it, it was messy paint sex. <laughs> I mean, they're just slapping it all over each other and smooching and rubbing and all that stuff, which to me, maybe this is a sign of me getting old and unambitious, but to me, paint sex just seemed messy. <laughs> just like, I just kept thinking the whole time, like, that is not worth all of the cleanup that you're going to have to do tomorrow. Like, maybe that's just me. I don't know, but there's no amount of, of passion that would make me get that paint all over my apartment. <laughs> I'd be like, you know what? Why don't we do a sexy shower instead? <laughs> it was funny. But after they had sex, Eden kind of mentioned to Daniel that it was a that she wanted it to be a no strings type of relationship. And I immediately thought, no strings, my ass. That girl has had her eye on Daniel for weeks. We had some really fun scenes this week between Jill and Gloria, which were unexpected and funny and fun, and I definitely want to see more Gloria and Jill together. They just play off of each other so well. I mean, they're both, like, veteran, amazing actresses, and it's just cool to see them in scenes together. Uh, they're, you know, they're sitting at the bar, at the athletic club, flirting with the bartender, all drunk, and... Uh, bemoaning their failed relationships. They've uh, both been burned. Jill's been burned by Colin. Gloria's been burned by Jeff. And actually, when you think about it, both <laughs> Gloria and Jill have gone after a lot of the same men. They were both married to John. They both had their turn at Jeff. Um, and, you know, I think pr probably if Colin didn't turn out to be a bad guy, Gloria would have probably tried to sink her claws into him sooner or later. So these two women have a lot in common, and it really was a joy to see them together. And throw Angelo into the mix, and I'm in. I am so into Angelo. He is awesome. And I liked that he came up to Jill, and he was just lightly flirting with her. Just, you know, just trying to, you know, making her feel good, you know, like a desirable woman. I don't know if he would be a good permanent character on the show, but he adds a little bit of comic relief when in so many other ways on the show right now. I feel stressed. <laughs> so it was nice to see Angelo bringing some levity into the situation. And uh, very, very interesting 
little scene, just brief. If you blinked, if you stepped away from your TV for a minute, you might have missed it. But just as Gloria is starting to really miss Jeff, we see this little scene of him on a beach somewhere like trying to rub two sticks together to start a fire and talking to this little football that he has sitting next to him, dr drawing a little face on it, and he's calling it squishy. <laughs> it is like a remake, YNR's remake of Castaway. It's very that. So Jeff is off on some deserted island somewhere. Of course, you know, it had made it seem, or he, you know, the situation seemed like Jeff just left Gloria. Like he, you know, spent all their money in Vegas and then just decided to run off and leave her. But now things are starting to look a little bit different. And is it a coincidence that just as Jeff goes bye-bye off to a, banished to a, <laughs> <laughs> to a desert island right as Angelo decides to move on in, decides to become a partner in Glowworm, something he's had his eye on for a long, long time, both the restaurant, the money, and Gloria. Angie is so awesome. This that entire storyline just it makes me laugh. Again, it's just it's it's pure comedy gold. Angie goes into Devon's recording studio, starts recording another ear bleeding, brain splitting song, and it's just truly, truly terrible. And she finally listens back to herself. She After she records the song, she goes to take a seat. Devon plays the recording back, and she has this dawned on her moment of realizing that she sucks. <laughs> it's like she finally hears herself for the first time, and she decides that instead of being a brat, she needs to get herself ready for the competition that's coming up. I'm looking forward to that. I just, it's funny and fun to me, and I love her interactions with Ke with Kevin. She calls him Kevy. <laughs> That's just really cute to me. And there is a little scene between Angelo and Angie where he intimates that he does not like her old ex-boyfriend. And so he ends up kind of hiring Kevin to keep an eye on her. Of course, I say hiring, but really Kevin is doing it because he's going to get a house out of it. I guess Angelo offered him, you know, either money uh, to buy a house for him and Chloe and Delia, or he just directly offered him a house. But either way, Kevin's going to be keeping his eye on her, which is really funny, in her fuchsia on fuchsia outfits. Um, and also, uh, Devon's going to be keeping his ear on her at the same time. So it should be interesting to see how that pans out. Okay, you guys, well, that's it for me for this week. The batteries on my camera are dying, so I gotta split real quick. I hope that you guys had a good week, that you're enjoying the show way more than I am, and that you leave me a comment and help bring me down, help calm me down, help give me some perspective on this. I'll be reading your comments, responding to them, and loving you guys, and waiting until next week till I can talk to you again. So everybody take care. I'll talk to you next time. Bye!